be to our webinar today. Um, some uh, has got a speaker phone on because I'm hearing some echo. So if one of our presenters or Bob could put the mute on the phone, I was hearing some background. Okay, Mercedes Burn Click. I'm here with the University of Iowa, and I want to welcome nursing home staff members and supporters of enhanced psychosocial care for nursing home residents. That's why we do these webinars, as we're trying to exchange information about how to give the best care possible to nursing residents and nursing home families. We have at least two webinars a month, and this month we actually we have three. Um, we have a best practice series. Those occur on our Tuesdays, one Tuesday a month. And then on Thursday, there's an emerging issue. Uh, the emerging issue webinars contain social work speakers or speakers from any discipline giving us a little bit more information about um, topics that might be affecting the nursing home social services and social work. For our best practice series, our Tuesday series, that's very specific to being a nursing home social worker, and we have uh, social workers who present that information. So that's a little bit about both of those. This session, uh, right now, those of you who uh, have logged in at this time, we have a chat box and a Q&A box, so you can put in a question in the chat box or Q&A box, um, and then I'll be looking at these and trying to respond to you individually during the session. Um, you can submit a question whenever you want, but we probably won't ask uh, the questions onto the presenters until after their <coughs> formal presentation. Uh, we're being recorded right now, and the recording should be available within a day. Uh, so look here if you'd like to see the recording. Um, this is the welcome section, and uh, then I'm going to turn over the uh, microphone to Bob Conley in a few slides, and he'll be introducing our topic and our speakers. And then the speakers are going to present for about 40, 45 minutes. And then we're going to open it up for questions and answers. So in order to get your question across or to include a comment as part of this webinar, please type it in the chat box or question and answer box. I, I, the chat box, if it's all the same to you. And then I'll be reading those responses for our, our presenters to respond to. So that will go. I'd like to recognize the National Planning Committee of folks folks who uh, we meet once a month to plan when our topics and think of speakers. And also at this point, I'd like to introduce Rob Bob Conley, who is a social worker with 20 years experience at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. In fact, he was the project officer for the MDS 3.0 um, and a member of the planning committee and the co-leader of this webinar project. <clears throat> so the uh, topic today is psychosocial interventions aimed to comfort persons with dementia. And I just want to mention that uh, um, this is a rebroadcast of a really excellent presentation, but our recording didn't work. And in kind of consideration to be sure your colleagues, you can tell them about it if you would like. Uh, rebroadcasting it, and we're giving Tina and Deidre the Good Sport Award for doing it a second time. I'll first introduce Tina. Um, Tina has spent more than 25 years working um, to advance the lives of persons with dementia. In fact, she's uh, got uh, appeared in a book called Palliative Care for Advanced Dementia and Dementia in the Gerontologist. Journal of Hospice, Palliative Nursing, and the American Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and Other Dementias. Tina is the Director of Education and Research and the Director of Comfort First, a dementia care education program at the Beatitudes Campus in Phoenix, Arizona, and she's having better weather than we are. She earned her Bachelor's in Science uh, and Master's of Arts um, both in psychology, uh, both uh, from North Arizona, uh, 
University. Uh, the speaker is part of our planning committee and a, a practicing social worker, administrator. Um, um, uh, has worked in, uh, has, is the core director of social work initiatives at Jewish Home Life Care, has worked in aging for over 20 years. Uh, she's received her undergraduate degree from Barnard College, her master's from Hunter, and she's currently a candidate there on um, as far as getting her PhD in social work. The other thing is that the workers were in a network, and their uh, comfort care program is being guided by Ann Wyatt of, in New York three uh, nursing homes to be a speaker on March 27th at 4 p.m. Eastern with Lisa Arthur. So we're out with great programs because this is an important dementia program. So I'll get over to Tina. Everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, our mission objectives today, we're going to be looking at what we should really expect for those who have dementia. We'll be looking at the profession and how it impacts folks. We'll be examining advanced care planning choices um, that can be made by the person who has uh, dementia and by their surrogate decision makers. And we'll be looking at a basic framework for social workers in which we can discuss advanced care planning. Let's begin by looking at the progression of dementia. And in this slide, you can see uh, that folks um, fall into one of four categories. And this is kind of important to know because as nursing home social workers, you see people along this continuum. And often I think we may see people in the mild or the moderate phase who are coming in through our rehab um, uh, and rehab for a rehab stay. And then we have folks who often stay in our long-term care areas who may have moderate or advanced dementia. One of the things we often forget to talk about is the fact that people who have dementia, unless there's some other outside comorbidity that impacts them, die as a result of the disease. And it's important for us to talk about this, especially within that framework of advanced directives, is that knowledge is power. When people understand that this is an illness which causes your death, then that allows the person um, who has the disease in the early stage when they still have capacity to make decisions that are meaningful, that impact not only their current life but their, their end of life, and it also helps surrogate decision makers understand what they may be facing. So what does it look like? With, with dementia, we know that many people here have difficulty with memory. Now, often this is categorized as disease in particular, but other um, irreversible dementias as well. It's described as a memory, as a problem or a memory deficit, and that of course does happen for the person in the mild phase of disease. Of the disease, in fact, often that's what takes you to the doctor for the first time. It's difficulty with short-term memory. It's much more of an illness than that, and it impacts the person's overall ability to think. So not only do they have difficulty with short-term memory, but also difficulty on with focus, with um, decision-making abilities. And what we know for these folks is that it takes many, many more repetitions of something for them to learn new information. Impact the way people do maybe with therapy as they're gaining new skills and an attempt to return home. We all know that folks who have mild dementia have difficulties with language. Often it it can be um, just limited to word finding difficulties. Not the kind of word finding difficulties that we often see in our own self. This is where it happens many times a day, and the person may be struggling. Um, with finding the right word or naming something, and it causes them a lot of frustration. I know that many people with mild dementia may have a disturbance in their mood, and it actually makes sense. As a decline in neurochemistry occurs with the dementing process, we know that these folks may have 
an opportunity for an imbalance in the neurochemistry that supports mood and is generally under-recognized and under-treated for these people. That appear, often it can appear, appear as the person is socially withdrawn. And if you're uh, particularly um, interested in preserving a sense of self, you may be reluctant to let others know that you're having difficulty thinking. These are folks who often have a lot of difficulty managing their finances. They say that they've uh, paid this bill or taken care of that obligation. But often what they've done is either forget it or they've paid it more frequently than they did. Uh, folks who have a broken start button, by that I mean they really struggle with initiating new events. They love playing bridge. They love uh, attending family outings. But they don't really put everything together so that they're able to start that event, especially in a time frame that all of us would consider appropriate for whatever it is. These people often have difficulty with driving, and they really shouldn't be driving, but in many instances they still are. Every person who has dementia is unique. And it's difficult to say when someone will move from a mild phase of the illness to the more severe phase. But all of things to look for are the person really shouldn't be alone any longer. They're not safe. They can't maybe find the restroom. Or when they put a pot on the stove, they forget that it's there. Uh, they burn it up. Um, folks who might forget to eat. And one person is really struggling with, with staying alone, that's when many of these folks come to live with us in a nursing home or an assisted living. At this point, the person really moves from mild to moderate. And memory, of course, has gotten more compromised in the second phase of the illness. People have only issues with short-term memory, again, learning much more tenuous and problematic, but also with long-term memory now. And we see that people don't have ready recollection of their more recent long-term memories and may often feel that the who comes to visit them is daughter. Memory that looks a little bit like Swiss cheese. So certain uh, long-term memories are intact, but there's kind of holes throughout the person's recollection of all types of memories, whether they're old, or they're new. But often these folks are beginning to forget personal history that is really meaningful to them. They may remember their birth date, but they may recall that they were married in 1945. Folks who are beginning to forget who family and friends are. They may listen as someone who is friendly, and um, they should probably know them, but they don't. Language becomes more impaired during this phase. We know that people have difficulty both saying what it is that we say and being understood. And, of course, this is really problematic in the nursing home because we can tell someone that, that uh, breakfast begins at 7, but they may not be able to recall it or understand what it is we're trying to convey. These are folks who really learn what that our behavior means Means something, and their behavior means something, so they begin to communicate much more clearly through their actions than they do with their words. These are folks who probably feel like to them they're on a bad cell call, and in that case, all they want to do is get off of it or get away from it. And so, what we sell, we often see is that people will say no when we ask them if they hurt, if they use the restroom or if they would like a cookie. So that response is no. Not because they don't want those things or they don't need those things, but rather because they don't understand what we're asking. These folks who have great difficulty with word finding, in fact, it's progressed to the point that often they cannot finish thoughts at all, get into a sentence, even and abandon it because they cannot just think their way through. These who often become quite distressed, especially during caregiving, and can become very self-protective because they don't understand what it is we're trying to do. And our best efforts to help them can cause distress and upset and often fear. 
severe. For the person who has Alzheimer's disease, this may be difficult for us to see because of the stoic nature of their face, which is part of the Alzheimer's um, process. These are folks who need a good deal of assistance, cueing, and physical assistance with all of their ADLs. And we know for many of them, especially towards the end of the moderate phase, that incontinence becomes quite problematic. Each person is unique in how they progress through the illness. We really can't say how long it takes to go through the moderate phase and enter the severe or advanced phase. But we do know that the delineation point or the jumping off point, as it's upon by experts, is that the individual is having difficulty moving around on their own, whether they're wheelchair bound or they're able to walk and that they need assistance from others to get from point A to point B. The other um, uh, point of discussion is that they begin to have such difficulty um, expressing themselves verbally that often they can only say seven words or so that have meaning. And these are words such as uh-huh or uh-uh, um, basic words that we would all kind of take for granted that, that uh, convey very little about what is going on uh, verbally for the person. The advanced or the severe phase of dementia, we see that these folks really live in the moment. They don't have short-term memory skill or, or long-term memory is so fragmented that they cannot recall any of their past history. We know that these folks cannot learn new information because the mechanism of their brain that's closely tied to where memory is housed, no longer works. So we can tell them that, that breakfast is at 7 in the morning, really, until we're blue in the face, but it will not have any impact on them. We folks really have a difficult time carrying a kind of meaningful verbal communication. They do communicate through their actions, but essentially they're limited to communicating in that method. We see folks often appear withdrawn to engage with their environment, not because they don't want to, um, because, but because it takes so much energy in the brain that is so impaired. Um, they tire easily. We see these folks who sleep uh, a great deal and that um, often um, they, can, they can hang on to something for five minutes or so that's meaningful to them and then they're able to do so after that. We know that people are, are essentially dependent on others for all of their ADLs. And the last six months or so of their life, um, they become good hosts for any of the uh, types of, of um, uh, live in, currently in our environment is that we would not be impacted by impact them. And we see recurrent infections. Difficulty swallowing, we often see weight loss. And as as a result, the person just becomes a really good host for all of the infection that actually lives every day in our world. Most commonly, people would, although the brain is caused by the illness, death is usually hastened by a recurrent infection such as pneumonia or a urinary tract infection. We, we talk about um, the struggles that we have and the challenges related to um, dementing illness. But what we talk about much of the time is how resilient our brain remains, even in, in um, the life of such incredible uh, devastation that we see at a cellular level for someone who has dementia. And so what I wanted to do is speak just for a moment on what remains for the individual who is impaired. And the thing is, the part of our brain that is responsible for when we are comfortable and when we are not remains intact until we progress. And for those of us who have been privileged enough to be at someone's deathbed, you can tell when the human body is comfortable and then isn't. And the resiliency that is that expert on my own comfort means that we as care providers 
don't have to be the expert. We can rely on the person to let us know, often not through verbal means, but through their behavior, what is comfortable for them and what truly makes sense. We also know that the person's emotional brain remains intact. And so the individual may be stoic as a result of the disease and not be able to give us the kind of expression that they once could, that their emotional brain is intact. What this is to us as caregivers is that and I cannot change the way you think, but I can change the way you feel. And if you feel good, then you will have a good day, even though you may not know what comes next. But that that prevalent good feeling really impacts the overall quality of your life in ways that are profound. Now, the only way to our emotional brain is through our five senses and in as much as they are intact. So we create these positive feelings through music, through taste good, um, through of children laughing, um, through anything that um, we can connect through the senses that make sense and engages the person. And we know that our very resilient brain understands the actions of others, where they are, and that they continue to be able to communicate with us through their actions, even up to and in, at the very end of their life. Now, DJ, I have some things to share with you. Okay, thank you, Tina. about focusing on the social worker's role in connecting both with the person of dementia and with their families. Through the work that I have done with Tina, I really come to firmly believe that one of the most important things that as social workers we can do is to help people to understand that most types of dementia cannot be cured. Facility, they don't understand that, that dementia is a terminal disease. They understand the course of the illness, and they don't know what to expect. It's really critical that we don't assume that families have all this information. So if you look back, and when you copy the slides later, Tina had a very nice slide which has the progression of dementia over four ages. And we since used that slide by laminating it and working with families to show the progression. And I can tell all of you on the phone that that's a very useful tool to help families and help staff understand dementia as a terminal illness. One of the things that at Life Care we have, have renewed to is training all of the staff to understand the stages of dementia. And the work of Tina Alonzo and the people at the Beatitudes campus have really helped to grow understanding. Workers can provide education to families. They can do this. We can do it through family care meetings, support groups, care plan meetings. We can do it at the point of transition from post-acute or sub-acute to long-term care. We have people with dementia coming into our post Cute, and they wind up staying long term. So the more information we give up front, the more we help families and we're proactive, and we don't wait for the crisis to start explaining to them. Yes, dementia is a terminal illness. It was brought up recently that really resonated for me. I was at a conference where a physician spoke about persons say who has pancreatic cancer and the person eventually gets a pneumonia and dies. She asked the room, what would you say the person died from? And the respondents in the room said, well, pancreatic cancer. They gave the same scenario and said that this person has dementia, has dementia for six years, and now has a pneumonia and passes away. What did the person died from? And the room were saying the pneumonia. So I think our goal is to help 
help families understand that people, in fact, die from the dementia, and the pneumonia was just an opportunist infection at the end of life. Position that the goal of all care for persons with advanced dementia is comfort and should be comfort. We need to look at how levels of care addressed at your facility. This is advanced care planning and one. Frequently, we know it's done as a one time discussion. Somebody comes into the facility, families may be asked, Do you have a health care proxy? Do you have any directives? Can I have them? And they can be by people at very different levels and people with different understandings. I would argue that this is a key role for social workers, trained in communication, to talk to families about goals of care with an understanding of dementia and the course of its illness. We also know we need to know who is the resident's family. The person we've described as their family member decisions are made in this family, a family where the oldest male makes a decision, or that everything has come to consensus, what the person would have wanted, what understanding of the illness. We need to question and listen for the response. You might feel families have an understanding, but yet when you ask them what they understand of the information being presented, have heard the same thing that the doctor had said or the nurse or what the doctor had told them until they're asked. Important and more so is becoming the laws around the country is what family understand about the person's end-of-life care wishes and they would have wanted and what would the goal have been. And then support the family need. Do they need pastoral care? Do they need a, do they need a support group? Do they need a partner? Regulations in your state can help guide how you work with families. So some key pieces of the goals of care discussion. Title conversation. So there is attention to detail, and of us to find quiet places in our organizations, but it needs to take place in a quiet area where there's not distraction, where there's a place to sit, and that all staff involved have the same understanding of dementia and the core of the illness and comfort as the goal, because one person with a different understanding of the illness can undo the conversation that has taken place. To take information in, they need the time to understand the benefits and burdens of treatment. Ask what did they hear, what do they understand. They need to know what can happen next. So look at what a family's want at end of care. And over again, the results seem to be they want their family member to be pain and symptom free. They want the sense that their loved one is receiving good care. And they communication with the nursing home staff. Family want information. And they want to say goodbye. Comfort first approach to persons with advanced dementia really looks at to care, not one where saying nothing can be done. About the resilient brain, emotion is still present. So we look on recognizing and relieving pain. How does this person communicate that they are in pain? And you all that Tina present when I asked a gentleman if he were in pain, and he said, no. Well, then down at his level and started putting her hand on his, on his chest and, and asking if it hurt, asking if he was sore, 
using different words besides pain? And he immediately said yes. And she recognized the sign of pain because he was touching his teeth. Look at new ways of assessing and approaching pain. We need the symptoms of if somebody is stressed rather than agitated as a word. But are they trying to tell us something's wrong? Are they bored, anxious? Is their appetite poor? Room too stimulating? Is that causing some of the upset? I've only thought about care plans when we've written, probably some of us have written, about a person's reject care or a person's stress. And we've looked at what piece of that is the care providers created by the of noise and chaos that can go on in a nursing home unit. An important point we want to make, that face care is an active approach to care. Nothing can be done. Trained as a social worker, we spend a lot of time on communication. We learn verbal and nonverbal communication. So, social worker in long term care is vital to helping everyone on the team understand what person bodies are telling us, how to observe in a new way. Is the person getting up and down frequently to show us their discomfort? Are they yelling out? Are they hanging out? Are they hanging the table? And we want to reframe this from this is just the way she is, she has dementia, to this is to tell us something. The things we had to really look at is who's attending our care plan meetings? And we in the past year to turn this around so that our nursing assistants, who are the primary person for the person being presented, are in attendance at the care plan meeting, and that that person has a voice to tell us about the person who's self-protective when they go in to provide care, the person who pushes away food at the dining room table, or who's going down from the chair a lot, or who's calling out. Gathering information to look at the cycle of the day and to remember that care takes place over a 24 hour period. Basic needs. Is the person being toileted frequently enough? Are they being changed? Are they moving their bowels? Are they having food to eat? Are they hungry? I'm tired. And one of the key areas we've been looking at is are we giving people nap? We're having people sit up in the dining room for a long period in the day. And we realized that we were having people sit up for way too long and needed to go back to bed and just get a good rest. In our care plan meetings, what makes this person comfortable? Naps, environment, getting a little fresh air. Maybe be f- familiar with Dan Cohen's work on music and memory with the iPods. So that personalized music, what music does this individual like? Because each phone, we all have music that we really enjoy and music that we really don't like. And for each one of us, that's personal. What is true for people with dementia? A set of music fits all find out what the person wants to listen to. Experience like, are we people have finger food that they can handle themselves? Are we in a way that is manageable? One thing we noticed here is we were putting too much food on the plate, which was completely confusing to people. The exercise, Tina has taught us that the person who gets up and down from the chair is really trying to say, you know, my push is really not too comfortable. So even if the person cannot walk, instead of telling them sit down, sit down, we're trying to attempt to have the CNAs or whatever staff is available to allow the person to stand up with one next to them and get a good stretch and a repositioning. 
massage, and focusing on relationships. The relationship the aid has to the to the poor, and a lot of information from the family about the person. It's spiritual comforts. What is this individual comfort and what has meaning to them? Are theirs that have always been a part of their life? So I myself, as somebody who had went 12 years of Catholic school, whenever crisis, I am going to turn to the Hail Mary. It's kind of written into my personhood. And my care plan when I move into a nursing home know the prayers that have meaning to the residents in our facility, to film the hymns that have meaning to them. Do we look at spiritual comfort as comfort found from nature or other ways of finding comfort? Tell people that they're safe. We just say we're sorry if they appear uncomfortable and we engage with them from an emotional viewpoint families to tell us as much as they can about the signs and symptoms of discomfort and help us understand what would make a family member in the facility more comfortable. Partners, they provide history and they help us to get to know each person. Our social workers implement that history and to share it with the rest of the community. We started making books that tells books about the person's life. They give some of their history, where they were born, their family of origins, their families when they've met, if they've had children, if they've been in relationships, tell us about their work, their education, things that were, made them very proud in their life. And look at ways of sharing that with the CNN and anybody who might work on the community. Just a simple form that was put together with staff at Comfort First in the Beatitudes campus, which looks at what are comfort foods, what do people like to sleep, how do we know when they're tired, what they may still enjoy doing, what music they might like. These simple sheets of information can be shared to all the staff. Information can also guide end of life care. Now to a case discussion, and I think we we'll put the case up. Us a bit about the relationship between us and a family member. Someone's transferred onto the long-term care unit of the nursing home. Can I interrupt you for just one second? Absolutely. Um, everybody, you're able to change how the case looks to you. So if you look at the bottom of your page. There's two micro, uh, magnifying glasses, so if you want it to look larger or smaller or whatever, so you can follow along. Or there's a scroll bar to the right that you can scroll so you can see what um, the case is. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Merge isn't up there yet. Ed. Um, because you, you're still the presenter. To present, and then I'm going to put the case. Sorry, that's okay. Okay. So we'll start giving you some of the key elements. Jones transferred onto the long-term care unit of the nursing home. Everything spent three weeks on a subacute unit following a hospitalization. She was hospitalized due to pneumonia. Niece, the hospital discharge plan planner encouraged her to admit her on for a short stay and some therapy before going home. Facility, she presented with moderate to advanced dementia. She had her long-term memory, was unable to carry meaningful conversations, and needed assistance with activities of daily living. Twice in the facility, poor social judgment and memory reminding her to use her walk. Examined after the fall, and there was no noted injury. He worked full time and having, was having a difficult time with the transition of her aunt moving to the long term floor, and she felt very badly that she was not bringing her back, back home. The fall was nice, and she was having a lot of difficulty trusting the staff to provide care. 
She requested that her aunt participate in multiple activities throughout the day and would become upset if she found her aunt was not doing anything. She stated that her aunt was always active and would not be comfortable sitting and doing nothing. She wanted her to go on trips to local events that she had enjoyed in the past, the aunt and Broadway shows. She requested that her aunt be sent to the hospital for a CAT scan and further evaluation be done in the hospital to make sure that she was okay. Jen at the nursing home felt the testing was not necessary as a nurse assessment had showed there was no noted injury. The rest continued to walk up and down the hallway. Ash attempted to keep up with her pace because she was very active. So we went over to a play between myself. Team coming to me the social to worker, and she's really happy with the care. Um, my name is Deirdre Downs. I'm the social worker here. How can I you? Because I'm the niece of Norms, and I really need to talk about her care. I'm not happy. So sorry to hear you're not happy some of the concern. I'm really here today because I think this gives us a great opportunity to talk. Notice whenever she sees you, a wonderful smile on her face. We have to understand she can't, but she raised me and I promised her she wouldn't come here and now she's here and everything's kind of going wrong and it seems like is she just getting worse um, more quickly. I know she has dementia, and I know that she's had trouble, but you know, it just seems like it's spinning control, and I don't know what to do. A number of really wonderful things. You're making sure your aunt is getting care, and you've come to talk about it. So let's w- let's work through this together. One that you that you understand she has dementia. Can you talk to me a bit about your understanding of dementia? Well, older people just get confused. That's part of getting older. She's almost 90, and of course she, she doesn't remember like she used to, but she's my aunt. you know. And, and honestly, she's always loved the theater. If you could just get her to the theater, well, she'd be her old self. I just know it. you said right from the beginning here was that you know, that she has dementia but she's 90 and, and you know implying most people at 90 will have dementia or have this memory impairment and a lot of people think that what dementia is dementia is an illness that progresses over time and I wish she would go back to being her old self wish we could do that for you, but while we cure dementia, we can really focus on getting a feeling of pleasure, like when she was at the theater. Can you know when your aunt is seeming happy or contented? Her face just lights up. You know, whenever I put on the Broadway show tunes in her room, you just see she looks half her age. She's so happy. She even sings along a little, even though I know she doesn't remember her. Well, we know that she connects to the feeling of the Broadway shows and the music, but that music has some real meaning to her. And being here helps us now understand that Broadway music gives her comfort. And so we're going to put that right into her care plan, that to please play the Broadway music during care. So please play it at times when she would like to relax. And we'll look for that same kind of smile and connection on her, her face. Because if we take her out to the Broadway show, I think what we would find is that it would be overstimulating and tra- transfer someone 
with what we consider your aunt has, which is an advanced dementia, would really be upsetting to her. When last time I took her, it was a little bit difficult. How that was? Well, we had to leave after the first act because she just really couldn't quite um, make sense of it, and ultimately she had to go home, so, so I took her. And often asking to go home is something to bring me to comfort. And the things that you were cut out, and I, I'm happened here. Your aunt has had two falls, and she falls because she get up and she, that brain that's supposed to remind her to use the walker isn't really working. But if we don't allow her to walk, we're going to make her really unhappy. There is some risk of falling also know that we need to tune in to when it looks like she's getting uncomfortable and needs to move around. But could you talk to the doctor about the CT scan? She said, my wife doesn't need it, but I want her to have the best, and not is not the best. What are you hoping the test will tell you? Or not, her brain is more damaged. There must be something we can do. We have something that we could do to stop the progression of dementia. And I have some materials that I'm going to give you that might be helpful to you in understanding this. But we can stop the progression, but we can really focus on keeping her comfortable at sending her to the hospital for this T scan is that would cause a lot of discomfort with any new information. It's difficult for someone with dementia to make sense of going to a hospital. It's a new environment, it's new voices, it's new faces, and then going into a machine, which would be confusing setting to those of us whose brain is fully working. You mean we have a choice that she doesn't have to go to the hospital? She doesn't go to the hospital. There was some an, an neurological assessment here done, which the doctor did to see if the falls had caused any further damage. And if you can explain that in more detail, the results were that it did not. What we can focus on comfortable understand what she's telling us, and including you as our partner in her care. Because it's so clear to me now, speaking with you, how devoted you are to her. And I want you to know that the CNA, Mrs. Maggie, she would like to hear more from you and be introduced. And let's get off to a new start together. Thank you. I really appreciate you meeting with me today. There's some things that make a lot more sense now. Meeting with you as well. So when we looked at case, one of the things that Merce asked us to, to look at was what were different perceptions of people involved? And what the perception of the resident she was communicating a need to us through pacing, bored or in pain or tired or hungry or needed toileting, or that a room was overstimulating. What we learned here was the television for persons with advanced dementia was just a source of distress and overstimulation, so we had to turn that off. Her perception was the staff not watching her aunt we're not preventing falls, and that we're not doing enough to engage her in activities. And we do this a lot. Families want activities, 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 but sometimes we need to educate them as to what activities are manageable and what are overstimulating. Perception might have been the niece is being difficult or too demanding and not knowing how to meet her needs. Also, had some frustration 
trying to understand what the resident was trying to communicate because I want to give the message that this is, while Tina is really an expert in understanding what people are communicating, we think of it as really trying to keep plugging away to figure out, okay, what are they telling us? Is it a basic need that's not being met? We're going to start there. Or are there's too much activity, there's not enough activity, they're tired, they're hungry, like some personal attention. To understand the course of dementia and then also grieving and struggling with the transition. How many times have we heard families say, I, I would never move her into a nursing home or would place her in a nursing home? We need explain that the testing would cause an upset to the resident and testing would be expensive and not helpful. So the preferred outcomes were to establish a level of trust between the team and the needs, to develop a care plan to provide comfort, and to understand what the person was trying to communicate. I guess we could open this up to questions. has any question that they would like to send to the chat box, um, that would be great. And I'm going to all these are some tools. Oh, yes. Thank you. If you want to talk about the tool a little bit as people type in questions or comments, go ahead, please. Oh, yes. Um, CompassionSupport.org is a website that gives you information. It has been put together by Dr. Patricia Bamba about um, the MOLST, which in a, it was originally started out as the PULST in Oregon, which is uh, Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. It comes an actionable medical order that transfers with a person between settings. And CompassionSupport.org, I think what I want to get across here is we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are all kinds of videos about how to have discussions about end-of-life care, how to work on doing directives, and how to do this, as it says, with compassion and support. The reason that we all need to understand what the laws are in our state. For instance, in New York, yes. there have recently been a quick session of new laws, which were the Family Health Care Decision Act, the Palliative Care Information Act, and the Palliative Care Access Act. So we need to be up to date about what the laws are in our state. So look for your state guidelines. If you Google Five Wishes, another very helpful tool on doing advanced care planning. Encouraging comfort care. This is a guide for families of people with dementia living in nursing home facilities. It was put together by the Alzheimer's Association, the Greater Illinois Chapter. It is, to me, the best piece of easily understood information about decisions that persons with dementia and their families will have to make around care. I put the number in there for you. The book is available in English and in Spanish. And I can see that at our facility on one floor, we have drastically improved the advanced care directives by a combination of conversation and these care guides. The final thing I put down is the work of Dan Cohen, which is the music and memory that iPod project, and uh, it's a very simple project to replicate. And if you Google memory, you'll see some of the work of Dan Cohen. Thank you. Any questions or comments from anyone? In the chat box. Uh, okay. Um, there is a question. Speak about the use of animal pet therapy with regards to end-of-life comfort care for residents with dementia. I could tell you a little bit what we're doing here, and, and Tina, I know, can do more. What we have found is that um, we have also been using animals for people who have responded to kind of cuddling with an animal. We do call people to bring pets in, and we have pets that visit. Um, what I've noticed is you have to know who really enjoys the pets, and there are 
people who love them. But you also have to know that there are some people who might get a little startled by them. And I would really encourage talk to the family members and get some history there. But when people enjoy them, they really light up. I would agree with you, Deidre. The other thing I would say is that at the Beatitudes, we've been able to, um, if a person is coming and they have a pet, they have able to bring their pet with them. And what we ask is that the pet, of course, have its vaccination and be able to get along with other pets. This is even in our nursing home where we've encouraged the practice. Now, everyone has a pet, but so often, um, connection with a pet that you've you know, years really does make a difference in terms of quality of life and probably needs to be considered in terms of what will really bring uh, comfort and happiness to an individual at a pretty vulnerable time. There's another question. Um, being a patient who's severely demented, what best approach to age with this pet? No, they are. Fine, they are. Um, generally speaking, uh, social workers will go social history about someone. If you don't have that readily available, do your best to find out. If all those things that have made a person proud over the course of their life, how they take their coffee. You know, um, the names of their children are, the names of their mother and father. Sometimes this will be all you need to engage that person, even if it's only for a brief time. Okay, thank you. Some comments uh, that they people have been enjoying the presentation, that both of you are strong. I got a message that was wonderful. Um, and some did ask if the slides from today are available. And yes, they are. They're on the nursing, National Nursing Home Social Work Network website, uh, saved as six slides per page. So um, they are available in that way. Another question, what about bringing pet therapy into the facility on a regular basis? What are your thoughts about that? Do have pets that on a regular basis? I would say to you that the Pioneer Network would say to you, we shouldn't have pet therapy as much as we should just have pets living in the facility. I know that we have had pets living here, and Tina does in the Beatitudes campus. But right now, we do have pets that come in and visit a couple of times a week, and we have just worked into what can be expected on the given day. And we do know which which of our members here really enjoy the pets and which do not. So um, my feeling is if you can do it, it's it really is fabulous for those people who enjoy it. And the, the perfect point is for those who don't, we don't burden or creations in their life that are stressful in nature. They're so individualized in terms of what the the person themselves would choose. Another question that has come in, um, I'm an individual with advanced dementia who's at the end of life and has fake, frequent UTIs, urinary tract infections. She's one involved family member who's been educated and re-educated several times and still insists on full invasive treatments for these UTIs. Any recommendations? I do. Um, the say is that sometimes it's how we ask the question. And so often, as, as I'm teaching uh, physicians, nurses, social workers, um, what, what I want them to do is ask the question in this way. Is a person who has a car see themselves in any inclination about what it is that they want in the past. What would they give you? What would they give you? So we encourage um, 
not what the person wants. We all want we want a person with dementia to be returned to full vitality. We want to be well, but we know that's not possible. So what we want is create the circumstance in which the person can speak for themselves. And it's like they already have. question is ask, what do you want me to do for your mom, your aunt, your husband? Then unfortunately what we often do is we put ourselves in that decision-making role of their death, when really you're going against what it is the person wanted. My mother said she wanted to be comfortable. My husband didn't want any heroics. That means something. And the person's voice back into the equation, often what happens is we see difference in the way that the decisions are made. There are some people, however, for religious reasons or just convictions beyond what we what we understand may choose everything for the person, and in which case we just have to honor those wishes. And the thing I would add to that is that the wishes have to stay connected to this family member who's making decisions that we don't agree with. And I know that that can be hard sometimes, but just continue to provide the support, even though we're thinking, why do they keep treating and treating? Oh, thank you. We do have um, two sessions coming up in February, two webinars that are specific to end-of-life issues. Um, so I encourage people to register for those upcoming webinars. There is another question. Um, when a woman with advanced dementia is living in the nursing home, what be expected from hospice with that person, not with the person's family, but with that person? Well, it varies by state. It is very important that if you have someone who is receiving hospice service, that you begin dialogue once that person is accepted onto service so that you know specifically from that hospice what kind of care and service you should expect from them. If there's discrepancy or there's you have a belief that it isn't working as, as it should, then a meeting of, of all the minds to come to consensus needs to be done and done quickly. Call for a meeting. Uh, don't have the next care plan meeting, but call a meeting at, at that point and right, have folks right. down and clear and, and kind right. of indicate you what know, the expectations are. And to be clear about the care plans, that you know, right. one of the things that we have done a lot of work on is making sure that the SNF care plan and the hospice care plan are really one and the same, so that we don't have different goals of care. Exactly. And same page. Exactly. All right. So, Marissa's Bob, uh, can I ask a question? Um, it, it works. My wife and I have been volunteering with a resident in a dementia unit in Maryland. And one of the things that I notice is that the, some, the, the one nurse works better with one CNA, or some CNAs are more attentive than others. As you're doing training of both professionals and CNAs, and as Deidre said, that the CNA is there and, and has a voice and has a say, how do you kind of both support that professional to CNA communication? And how do you people that have a harder time with the concept that, that you're presenting? that the engagement of the CNA has to be genuine. And we'll quickly pick up whether your inclusion and inclusion is from a place of really wanting to know and wanting to connect or not. And it's that it's clear that it's a real connection and you, you view the CNA as a person who is key to the care of individual and an important member of the team that's going to flow so naturally. 
And for anybody who doesn't believe in making that connection, once they that when you do, how much better the care gets for the person and for the team, it will quickly change their mind. I, I really believe that. The other thing I might add is that, that, that often this, the decision to include the voice of the CNA is made at a managerial level has to be reinforced within nursing administration mm -hmm. that this is a change. We are um, re-examining the way we gather information. We've always gathered information about the individual and their needs, but now including another voice that has a reasonable information and actually can be the voice of the person mm -hmm. since they have lost their ability to verbalize. And often managers are confronted with this Karen's is delivered even in terms of how the information is gathered. And all I can say is be brave because ultimately everyone's comfort depends on it, including yours, because what we want are the best possible outcomes for people with dementia. And when we include CNAs, we with the best possible outcome for the person who has moderate to advanced dementia. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Um, while I'm waiting to see if if anybody wants to type in a quick question, I'd like to remind folks that we have two webinars next week. Uh, Tuesday of next week, it's on social workers as liaisons to family members, including coordination of care planning meetings. And then a week from Thursday, on Thursday, December 19th, we have a meeting about. Um, initiatives and coordinated care transition programs. So please check the website and uh, register for for those if you'd like. Uh, let's see. The website for the Nurses Social Works site you mentioned earlier. Okay. Um, website, frankly, people, when, you, when the webinar is over, you'll be sent to an evaluation form. I, I think it's like two questions. And then you finish that evaluation form, you're sent to the website. So you'll be driven right to the website there. Um, are well, any last words, Tina or uh, Deidre? Say thank you for the opportunity and happy holidays to everyone. It's always a, it's always a pleasure just to be able to uh, chat in vicariously with social workers from across the country. So thank you. Thank you.